Welcome to Shed Talks. Um, the program hasn't started yet. We're going to start right around 530. Um, so as you're joining, we do have some fun little um, questions uh, that we can ask you. So Katie will introduce that in a moment. My name's Michelle, and I'm a learning specialist here at Shed Aquarium. Um, and my colleague is, go ahead and introduce yourself, yeah. Katie. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Katie Rouse. I am also a learning specialist here at Shed Aquarium and work with our aquatic science course. So while we are wait, waiting for folks to join, are you able to hear me? Yep. Um, sorry. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do some trivia. So we're going to be launching some polls for you guys to answer. I'll go ahead and read the questions first. Uh, each of these questions is going to be a uh, representative of something that we may have learned with one of our different groups. At the bottom, you'll see which group uh, we connected with. So for example, the question we're doing today uh, is from our freshman field trips, and this is a topic that we discussed with our freshmen. So the question is, what percent of plastic is recycled by Americans? A, 9%, B, 29%, C, 51%, or D, 62%? And I'll give you guys about 30 seconds to answer those questions. And let's try to get those final answers in in about 10 more seconds. All right. Oh, we have some well-versed plastic con uh, folks on here. So the correct answer is 9%. Uh, so about 75% of you got that one correct. I know it's, we always kind of hope or feel like we're maybe doing more than that, but truthfully uh, here in America, we only recycle about 9% of the plastic. So when we meet with our freshmen, we talk about the different ways that they can actually help to combat uh, plastic pollution. And we talk about the four R's here at SHED. So we talk about reduce, reuse, and recycle. And then we have a fourth one that we call refuse. And that simply means that you would be refusing to take things like a plastic straw or plastic silverware when you order food um, or get takeout. So good job, you guys are off to a good start. Uh, let's go ahead and see the next question. So this is an example of content we would have learned with our sophomores and their sophomore career panel. So how do trainers and aquarists provide top-notch care for the animals at Shed Aquarium? A, through positive reinforcement training, B, through uh, providing enrichment, through food, play, training, and new experiences, C, monitoring their behavior and health, or D, all of the above. And if you're just joining us, we're doing a little pre-show trivia. Um, it's an example of questions that um, cover content that students would have learned throughout the year. So no stress, you're not late. It's just a little pre-show trivia. Well, it looks like we've got all of our answers in. All right, we'll see where, how we did. Oh, perfect score on this one. Yeah, all of the above. So here at Shed, uh, we do all of these uh, pieces to ensure that the animals here are, have the best care possible. Our sophomores have the opportunity to meet many of the experts that work here at Shed, and they'll get to see things like a, uh, a training session. Um, we sometimes go to visit our kitchen and talk about how food is prepared and where the food comes from that our animals are fed here at Shed. Um, as well as um, how we monitor their health. And so uh, many of our students got to meet either vet techs or veterinarians that work here at Shed Aquarium. And we discussed the fact that uh, Shed has a full animal hospital on site and ha we have the ability to um, care for our animals very quickly if they ever need help here at Shed, as well as all of the kind of maintenance and regular checking in. So our next question here is an example of something that our aquatic science course students would know. So there are over 75 species of freshwater mussels in Illinois and 300 species in the United States. These mollusks live in shallow streams and rivers and SHED has established three research sites on local rivers to monitor the populations and the diversity of these filter feeders. Which of the following is not a real name of a freshwater mussel species? A, monkey face, 
B, pimple back, C, pig toe, D, pectoral, or E, creeper? If you've just joined us, we're doing a little bit of uh, pre-show trivia, um, representing questions that our students uh, would have learned last year through the different experiences with Shadow Academy. All right, let's do about 10 more seconds. Try to get your answers in here. So we're trying to select which of these is not a real name of a freshwater mussel species. So we okay, have, we got everyone. yeah, nice. So 14% of you selected monkey face, 71% with pectoral and 14% with creeper. The correct answer here, which is the wrong answer, I guess, is pectoral. That is not the name of a freshwater mussel. Uh, it is the name of a actual human mussel. Um, so the rest of these are the names of different freshwater mussels. And if you ever, if you've never really looked at the names of freshwater mussels and you want a good laugh, uh, there's a lot of very interesting names. And we only included a few of them here. Um, others that are kind of interesting are uh, pistol grip, which is a mussel that if you hold it, it feels like the grip of a pistol. Um, there are elk toe and fawn's foot, which if you look at them from the side, they uh, actually look like the hoof of uh, elk or fawn or deer. Um, so I think that's pretty interesting. It looks like we've had a few more attendees join us. So we're doing a little bit of pre-program trivia. Um, these questions are things students would have learned throughout last year through the different Shedd Academy species uh, or um, through the different Shedd Academy programs. And we've got one more question left for you. Great, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So last question, this is something both our interns and our aquatic science course students would be able to answer. Shed studies uh, which marine gastropod species that are an important food source and economically important in the Bahamas? A, nudibranchs, B, queen cock, C, limpets, or D, hermit crabs? And we'll go just 20 seconds on this one since we are at 5.30. All right, so we're gonna close that out. Let's see how we did. Fantastic, queen conch is correct. So Dr. Andy Cow uh, researches uh, queen conch in the Bahamas. He likes to refer to them as the uh, Chicago hot dog of the Bahamas. They are a very important food source there. And um, there's a lot of different ways that folks like to eat conch down in the Bahamas. And so protecting that species, making sure they have a thriving population is really important. All right. so. We are going to go ahead and get started. So welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you can join us today. Uh, we are going to be using the webinar feature for Zoom. If you haven't used that before, that means that we cannot see or hear each other, or you guys cannot see or hear each other, uh, and we cannot see or hear you. Uh, so in order to ask questions today, please feel free to use the Q&A function um, to ask any questions that you have as we go through different experiences. We will answer some of those uh, in the moment if we can. Some of them we'll answer at the end. Uh, but we will try to get to all your questions today if we can. So without any further hesitation, we're going to go ahead and get things started. And I'd like to introduce you all to Max Metz. He is the manager of school and teacher programs here at Shed Aquarium. Thank you, Katie, and thank you, Michelle, for a real fun um, intro uh, as we are having people join. Um, we're really excited to have everyone here today and learn more about and participate in uh, the Shed Academy program. To get a sense of the larger scope of the program, I wanna first uh, focus on each component of the Shed Academy partnership to give you a sense of 
what those in-school components are of Shed Academy. And Katie referenced those throughout the trivia as well. Uh, one of our first one is the Shed Academy freshman field trip. And that's where the entire freshman class or sometimes sophomore class comes to Shed Aquarium either virtually or in person to um, really start to think about science, start to understand the aquatic world a little bit more and get inspired to engage with Shed in other ways. One of those other ways might happen during their sophomore year, during some sophomore career exploration. And this is a perfect time for students to start thinking about different careers. Um, and we use all of the careers that make Shed a, an amazing place to, um, uh, as examples uh, for them to see. Uh, so sometimes this might be our business operations or development or um, some of our animal health or even um, our learning and teaching staff. Um, their junior year, um, st uh, students as part of the, the Shed Academy partnership are able to take part in the aquatic science elective course. And this is an opportunity for them for the entire year, two semesters, to be thinking about both freshwater and marine uh, ecology with um, uh, Katie and Michelle actually as uh, Shed Aquarium teachers, uh, as well as their full-time teachers at their schools. So in a, in a partnership, which is wonderful. And then uh, one of our last uh, in-school components of the Shed Academy partnership is the internship program. And so that is a full year uh, uh, opportunity for teens from each of the schools that we partner with to be able to come to Shed, um, sometimes virtually like last year, um, and sometimes in person as well, to engage in 21st century career learning um, and uh, just learn in general about um, the many opportunities that Shed can open the doors with. Now, um, in thinking about our commitment to environmental education and developing our next generation of environmental leaders and champions, um, we can really see that through the goals of the Shed Academy program uh, in nurturing curiosity and building knowledge, um, increasing knowledge around and abilities to act for the aquatic animal world. Uh, impacting social environmental identity, which is how we feel about the environment and how the environment relates to us. As I said about developing those 21st century learning skills, so collaboration, communication, and many others, as well as participate, participants, um, students feeling part of the SHED community, being part of SHED. Um, and then lastly, having a positive impact on their school environment and increasing different resources and opportunity for students, teachers, administrators, and so many more. Now, as, as many of you may know, few cities in the US can really match Chicago's rich natural resources, and especially the access and connection we have to Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes is home to 20% of the world's fresh water, and that is a, such a critical integral resource that is part of our culture, society, and economy. However, the value of this resource isn't often internalized or experienced equally by all of the city's residents. And so in turn, this creates two unique challenges for, the Chicago, for Chicago youth that we intend to address. One being limited access to nature and another being a lack of uh, educational opportunities. Shed's strategic plan will unlock some significant new ways to improve and increase learning opportunities and ensure that every student in Chicago can realize their potential to thrive and contribute to a thriving world. Um, our plan is to invest in Chicago's young people um, and it centers on an environmental education access initiative with the three targeted strategies on the screen. So providing equitable access to nature for every Chicago student, empowering a future of promise, potential, and possibilities for Chicago's youth, and uh, also very important, uh, sustaining communities through partnerships. Now, through this talk, you will see and even experience the ways in which we're implementing these strategies through Shed Academy. Uh, despite the major disruption through the pandemic, we've created a strong, resilient foundation for Shed Academy that impacts both in school and out of school time that addresses that whole child and helps to address an opportunity gap and access to nature. So now with that overview, um, I'm gonna uh, turn it back to Michelle and Katie so we can explore Shed Academy through our successes virtually and out in nature, along with um, hearing a little bit more from our stakeholders about what they're looking forward to for the new year. 
Hi, my name is Michelle, and I am a learning specialist that works on many of these programs, especially the aquatic science course. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about last year and some of our successes so you can get a better idea of what our programs look like. So this past school year, we <coughs> Uh, transitioned our programming online, and that was challenging, but we adapted and we improved and we made impactful connections with the students to ensure they could still look nature in the eye, even if it was through a screen. Upon reflection, we discovered that some things even worked better in a virtual environment, so that was great. Um, there are certain things um, like spaces in the aquarium or experiences in the aquarium that are too challenging to bring a large group of students to in person, but we can bring a camera and provide a special up close and unforgettable experience, even though we were in person. So Katie, would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, what they're seeing um, in these pictures on the screen? Yeah, absolutely. So as Michelle mentioned, what we learned last year was that for some pieces, we just couldn't provide the same experience uh, in person as we were actually able to virtually. So we have two photos here uh, in the top left and bottom right hand corner. Uh, the top left was from one of our freshman field trips and the bottom right uh, was from one of our sophomore career explorations. Um, and for those activities, we were able to go behind the scenes and students were able to get a up close and personal kind of uh, interaction with these aquarists and marine mammal trainers here at SHED. So in the top left, they were able to see uh, some of our, our uh, those areas behind our wild reef uh, and above the giant wild reef habitat that we have um, downstairs. They learned about the training methods that we use for the sharks, uh, what the day-to-day -day work looks like for an aquarist and kind of those behind the scenes spaces um, upstairs, uh, mid-level mid upstairs, I guess, above the aquarium. Um, and then with Jen, uh, we were able to connect with our otters in the actual habitat. And so Jen was able to talk about her career, um, how she got to shed. And one, I'm not sure if you guys are able to read what some of the questions were that the students asked during that connection. Um, but some that were really impactful and powerful to us were uh, them asking Jen how she was able to figure out what she wanted to do for her career, and what her journey was like, um, if she enjoyed her job, some students even wanted to know if they were dive certified, if they'd be able to volunteer here at SHED and also be part of SHED's mission. Um, and then a few other questions they asked were how much time she spends in the water each day and how many training sessions she gets to do with those otters. So really had that opportunity for all of the students to feel connected and as though they had a one-on-one -on -one experience with some of our aquarists here at the aquarium. Uh, two others that I'll talk about really quickly are the two kind of in the middle, um, but we have myself and Michelle uh, over the tide pool at Shed. We were doing a tide pool feeding and this allowed every student to see and really experience watching a sea urchin eating kelp. That would have been really hard if we'd had 30 students kind of crammed around that space, but by having a camera and being able to show it uh, virtually, every student was able to experience that moment. And then the picture on the bottom left uh, is myself and Becca uh, with our archer fish in the mangrove habitat. And we could have gotten more students down there, but still not the 30 that we were hosting. And they were able to see and ask questions of Becca and see how these archer fish use their really unique uh, method of achieving, uh, finding food in their habitats. Thanks, Katie. For, thank you for sharing about some of those virtual program highlights. And now we'd like to put you in the shoes of our lucky students who got a really fun experience during one of our freshman field trips. So let's enjoy one together. The, on the screen, I've got some participant questions and quotes that came from this surprise experience that you're about to have. So take a few moments to read those and see if you can guess what, um, I guess, who you're going to get to meet. So you're going to meet something that has whiskers, so that's exciting. <laughs> and after this experience, um, the students, uh, I love their reflection, the saying, the workers seem genuinely happy to be there. I'm glad that our joy as Shed Aquarium staff translated through the camera, as well as they saw the great connection that um, our staff has with the animals um, here. So let me uh, stop sharing here, and we are going to join Duke in our sea lion behind the scenes area. Hi, Duke. How's it going? Hi there, how are you? Great. It's going pretty great back here. So I've, yes, I do have whiskers too, but you guys are gonna meet one of our sea lions. His name is Laguna, and he happens to be joined by our other animal care specialist, Mina, 
And she's been actually working with him his whole life, the whole time that he's been here. She actually um, was able to go to the rescue center that he was taken to and brought him here to shed. Um, he's nine years old, so he has known her his entire life. So there is a lot of trust and a very positive relationship that they have together. Um, him being our youngest, he is the most inquisitive and most energetic animal that we have within our sea lion collection. And he is just an absolute joy to work with. He's super silly, super funny. Um, he has his likes and his dislikes. Right now he's enjoying taking little dips back into his pool, um, but obviously his favorite um, reinforcement or rewards are those big herring that we've been giving him. Um, since he is our youngest, he still has a lot of growing to do. Um, he's about, I'd say, close to six feet long and over 250 pounds. Um, our largest animal is about eight feet long. Our largest sea lion, rather, is about eight feet long and about 600 pounds. So um, Little Laguna's got a lot of growing to do, and I can't wait to see how big he gets when he grows up. Um, just like all of us, we have our uh, different physical characteristics. So if you were to come to shed, aside from him being the smallest, he's got these really long whiskers, um, not as long as our oldest Biff's, but they are um, pretty long. Um, he's got a very dark co uh, coat. Um, so since he is a marine mammal, he has this dark, sleek fur coat. It doesn't necessarily keep him warm, but our water is getting colder um, by the day just due to the outside, the weather, uh, seasonal changes. Um, so he's going to pack on a little bit more blubber for the winter time, and that's just a layer of fat under his skin that's very common for marine mammals to have. Um, actually, all marine mammals except for sea otters have um, that blubber layer. So our, our water gets to be about 55, 54 degrees at the coldest in the wintertime, which with a seven millimeter wetsuit on, it's, uh, it's still pretty chilly. Um, but he's got other adaptations too. He's got these large eyes. Um, which help him see above and below the water. Their corneas are actually flat. So that's just an adaptation that helps them see well above and below. You can see he's got this, um, these nares, on, essentially his nose. So he takes a breath and those just instinctually close to keep water out since they do spend the majority of their time in the water, when, aside from when they're sleeping on land. Um, he's got these giant, uh, pretty large teeth. He's got about 40 of them. They're um, dark in coloration just because they, they lack the enamel that um, we and other mammals have, um, but they have a symbiotic relationship with a natural bacteria in their environment that keeps their teeth clean. So they're brown, but that's perfectly normal for a sea lion. And he's got these pectoral flippers, I'd say they're about three feet long, and inside they've got, uh, essentially if you were to x-ray uh, his flippers, they would look like a human hand, just a lot bigger. Um, and one fun thing that sea lions have too, they actually have toenails. Um, so he's got those rear flippers, which he uses to walk and run on land. And since he is so nimble, he's pretty quick. Um, but that's a fun little tidbit right here. A little unique thing that not a lot of people get to see is those are his toenails. And that's his little tail right there. Good job, Laguna. That's amazing, Duke. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, participants, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A and um, Duke can answer them. Go ahead, Duke. Yeah, so he's he got a pretty wide repertoire of behavior. So we like to go into our training sessions with an idea of what we want to accomplish, whether we want to have a play session, a husbandry session, which is just practicing healthcare behaviors, um, exercise sessions, um, or just a combination of everything. Um, one fun thing that I like to do too is just what I call um, scavenger hunts or enrichment feeds. So I'll, I'll make giant ice cakes. Um, at one point um, over the, the shutdown, I gave him over 300 pounds of ice on our sea lion exhibit and he had quite the ball with it. Um, since he is pretty strong, he's able to throw those ice blocks around. So um, we just kind of took advantage of no, no guests being around during that time, but uh, the 300 pounds of ice was contained on our exhibit, but it was just fun to do. And then as it gets colder, um, when it does snow, we'll find the cleanest snow and we'll actually uh, put snow on the exhibit too. And he, he tends to kind of investigate it, but the sea otters tend to like it a bit more. There he is showing off his little tongue for you. So he, he knows a lot of uh, behaviors too. And all of the behaviors that he knows are very in complexity. Um, a lot of people ask how long it trains to be, uh, train a behavior. And the answer is there's no set answer. It depends on the individual and then the, the behavior that you're training itself. Um, so that, that uh, sticking his tongue out took about six months to, to um, train to completion. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. We have a question um, from Matt asking, do sea lions ever get dizzy? 
Yeah, I'm sure they do. Um, so we all have that the fluid in our ears that uh, if we get spun around a lot, uh, then uh, we do get dizzy. But he likes to do those little brake spins on the ground. He seems to find those high energy behaviors pretty reinforcing. Um, and if I have never seen him uh, show any signs of wobbliness or dizziness out of after doing them. But we'll maybe have him show off a couple more behaviors and then he's going to go back for the evening. It's another little spin. And you can see he just like easily jumps a couple feet into the air and we saw that, that 200 plus pounds up into the air. You never want to um, underestimate how strong or fast they are. Um, while we were shut down, we were able to take advantage of um, the aquarium and the, the spaces that the public are usually in, not just Wellington, but Laguna got to run around our oceanarium area, um, the amphitheater. So it's just kind of fun trying to be creative with our uh, the unique opportunity of being able to take care of the animals here at the aquarium while no guests were here. You can see how flexible he is too. They've got extremely flexible vertebra in their back. So he's able to actually take his head and touch um, his rump a bit. Good job, Laguna. All righty. Uh, one more quick question. Does, sure. um, how deep can he dive? So out in the wild, they can d dive up into the hundreds of feet. So he's waving goodbye real quick, and then he's going to go back to his habitat for the evening. Um, out in the wild, they, they have the ability to dive several hundred feet. Um, here at Shed, our deepest, we, he takes advantage of Whale Harbor, which is our deepest habitat. Um, he's been pretty active um, in our new presentation, um, so that's been fun to train. Um, we have seven different uh, habitats that are all interconnected to some degree. So for the show, he actually uh, is sent from our medical pool, which is where I am um, behind the scenes, and then jumps out onto the show stage, which is pretty fun to hear all the oohs and ahs of people that weren't necessarily expecting him to come out yet. Um, but they, they have adapted to swim quite deep. Well, that question. was that was so awesome. Thank you so much, Duke, for that Absolutely. presentation tonight. And thank you for always supporting Shed Academy with your great uh, answers to the questions um, from the students. Thanks so much. No problem. Thanks, guys. Have a great evening. You too. So um, as staff, we get just excited to see the animals up close like that, because that's not something that um, you would get to see every day at the aquarium, a sea lion training session. So that um, was pretty special. And our freshmen definitely enjoyed that during their field trip as well. So we've covered some virtual highlights from um, last year, but now I would like to talk about some of our outdoor successes. So we've talked a lot about virtual, 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 but we were able to um, actually get outside a little bit. So SHED's mission is to inspire curiosity, compassion, and conservation for the aquatic world. And one of the ways that we do that is by taking students into nature so that they can explore the habitats uh, that we hope to preserve. So in the spring, we found a few ways to connect with students in nature in a safe way. Um, many staff were vaccinated. We had masking requirements and social distancing to keep everyone safe. Um, so the first one I'd like to talk about was our senior interns from CICS Northtown. Uh, throughout the year, they explored conservation topics um, virtually. They met some shed conservation staff and explored uh, ways that conservation can happen in their community. And one of their projects that they decided they'd like to do was to build bird houses for their school grounds. So um, one intern was also able to participate in a shed action day while she was exploring um, ways to support her community and conservation as well. So there's a picture of um, one of the interns removing buckthorn at Skokie Lagoons. And that intern commented on how enjoyable it was to be out in nature. She said she wanted to take her family back. And um, she really uh, said it was really nice to not look, be looking at a screen that day. So that was great to hear. Um, so her quote there is, for me, I would definitely tell people to join this internship because it's very student led. We had guidelines, but we didn't have anyone telling us what to do for our project. And we definitely got to do whichever one we were interested in. So that's great to hear that student excited about her outdoor activities as well as the, um, the internship in general. Another outdoor success we had was with our aquatic science uh, course, which is mainly taken by juniors. Um, and we did a field expedition. 
And we actually have our first one for this year scheduled next Monday, which I'm excited about. But we did this in May. And students from St. Lawrence, they had been partnered with Dr. Melissa Youngquist as a part of their class. Um, Every uh, class gets to connect with a freshwater and a marine researcher. And um, so they had already connected with her in the first semester virtually and learned about her work in the forest preserves. And they did some real science by helping analyze camera trap images at her sites. Um, they were looking for mammal abundance. So they were identifying animals um, and uh, looking at the abundance of those mammals at the restored sites in the forest reserve and then the unrestored sites, so sites that Shed had not done restoration work at. Um, and then in May, we were actually able to take the students out to the sites that they had studied virtually the whole year. And you could see them just glowing. They were so happy to be together outside, getting their hands dirty, um, getting their boots wet. So it was a really, it was a really great time. So um, everyone there, it was funny, we all just kind of took a moment to appreciate how um, new it was to be in person um, and together. And we all commented on how, how tall people seemed um, online. So um, uh, the, one of the highlights was um, looking at macroinvertebrates. Um, so tiny little insects um, and other invertebrates in the, the ponds um, that were at the sites. Um, we took out uh, digital microscopes and the students got to look at those up close and they really enjoyed that. So um, through all aspects of Shed Academy, we like to connect students to the natural world, but the, also the professionals that work in this field and in the field. Um, so students really seem to value these experiences because the way I can tell that is they always ask a lot of good questions and I'm always impressed at um, their poise and asking these scientists um, their, about their curiosities and how they do their work and it's really just great to see um, students engaging in, a, in professional conversations um, while also exploring their, their curiosities. So we make these career con and nature connections in all of the programs um, with Shed Academy, but we really do it most notably in our sophomore career experiences. So I think we're gonna connect with Katie and Dr. Melissa Youngquist now in the gardens. Katie, um, how's it going? Is it a little too windy? How's it, what are we thinking? Yeah, I think you heard the wind a little bit there. I think we should be okay. Um, okay. Wonderful. It's also, it's also threatening to rain. So if we take <laughs> off, uh, it's cause it finally decided. Okay, so I will now highlight um, you all. We're, we are being joined by Dr. Melissa Youngquist to learn a little bit more about her research and her experience uh, with Shed Academy. Great, thanks so much, Michelle. So I'm out here with Dr. Youngquist. We are near the wetland garden outside of Shed. So we have a few gardens that have been planted to represent different habitats in Illinois. Um, and so Dr. Youngquist, before we get started, um, since we just talked about our connection we did with St. Lawrence, was there any moments from that day that were really stood out to you or anything that was really memorable for you that day when we went out with them? Yeah, so I think uh, the highlight was watching the kids discover what I rediscover every year, and that is how much life is hidden in our wetlands. Um, you walk by a pond, you just you might not see anything, but if you take the time to just look under the leaves and the rocks um, and search the water, you'll see so many different kinds of insects um, and tadpoles living in these habitats. And so it's just so fun to watch the kids learn all that. Great, thanks. Yeah, I enjoyed that as well. It was one at, why it was one of my favorite uh, moments last year. Um, so we're gonna run this just kind of we did for our sophomore career explorations. Uh, so I guess to start out, um, Let's talk a little bit about how you came to SHED and what your career journey was. Yeah, so I started in SHED in 2019 um, to be the, the amphibian research biologist here and study how wetland restoration benefits all our amphibian friends. And I got started on my career in undergrad where I did some uh, summer research experiences with my professors and we actually were looking at fishes and sea urchins. But amphibians have always been my first love. And so when I went to grad school, um, I focused on how habitat affects amphibian communities and that brought me to SHED. Amazing. Um, and any other pieces, how has your research been going? Um, a little bit about what you're looking at. Yeah, so um, there are so many wetlands here in Chicago and a lot of them are really high quality and unfortunately some of them are not so high quality. They are invaded by species like uh, European buckthorn and other invasive plants, which crowd out the ponds and make it a bad habitat for tadpoles to grow in. 
And so working with Shed Aquarium, our action team, and the community volunteers, we are removing buckthorn from around ponds and investigating how that benefits the amphibians, the insects, the mammals, and the birds um, in our forest reserves. Amazing. All right, and I, I saw that Max had put in the chat. If anyone has any questions for Dr. Youngquist, please feel free to um, share them with us. Um, we'd be happy to answer your questions as well. Um, but I was wondering, so you said that you're studying things other than amphibians. Um, what kind of other animals are you looking at and how do you collect that data? Right, so the other main amphibians or animals we're looking at um, are the aquatic invertebrates. And so this includes things like dragonflies lay their eggs in the water, um, mosquitoes lay their eggs in the water, beetles lay their eggs in the water. And so this creates a whole food web um, in addition to our tadpoles. And so we want to look at the predators and the prey that are in our ponded habitats. Uh, but they also have our wildlife cameras, which is what students looked at um, in the fall. And that's looking at how does deer behavior change with restoration? How does raccoon behavior change and coyote behavior change when we restore these ponds to optimal habitats? And then right. Katie, we do have a question. Um, how many different frog species are found in the Chicagoland area? Wow, that's a great question. We have 14 amphibian species um, in Cook County, and I believe about nine of them are frogs. All right, I don't see another question coming through. Um, have you seen any, what's been the most interesting thing that you found so far at a habitat? Anything that you haven't been expecting yet or any surprises the last few years? So this year was a very surprising year for me with the frogs because it was such a dry spring that lots of our ponds dried early and we didn't have any toads breeding at our sites because there was no water. But then when the rains came out, a huge thunderstorm in the end of June and all our ponds got re-wet, they reponded, and all the toads came back and bred um, late in the season. And then all their tadpoles metamorphosed really, really fast. Um, and so it was just, it was a very surprising year for me. Nice. That's wonderful. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have um, for now. Thank you so much, Dr. Youngquist, for sharing a little bit about um, your journey and the work you do with SHED and giving our participants a little bit of that sophomore career experience. All right, thanks you guys. Wonderful, Bye. thank you. Okay, so now we have covered our uh, virtual successes for last year. We've talked about some of our outdoor successes and now I'd like to um, discuss um, a little bit, um, sorry, I'd like to discuss a little bit about what we are excited for um, for next year. So we're definitely excited to share more in-person experiences uh, where we get to connect students to nature and animals. So let's take a moment to hear from last year's interns about why an internship with Shed Aquarium is a good choice. This is from a video that was filmed to recruit the interns for this year um, from CICS. So let's hear about their experience. I would recommend this to any of my friends or classmates who are just like soul searching or sort of confused on what career path they want to take in college or if they just need a sense of direction. Um, and I would also like advise them to go in with an open mind because there is so much, so many different routes you can take with SHED. It isn't just marine life, it's also conservation. I mean, we discussed the pri SHED's priorities. So curiosity, compassion, and conservation. So there is so many routes you can take with this internship. So I'd highly recommend this to anyone and everyone I see. I think this experience, uh, like these, these few months, gave me a great experience for like when I move into college and I go to college, because college is always trying to get out there into like uh, the city. I think you could use this information and help uh, change how our community works. And you could also reduce pollution, help animals, and create better environments. For me, I would definitely tell people to join this internship because it's very student-led. So like we didn't have any, like we had guidelines that we had to follow for our project, but no, there was nobody telling us what we had to do for our project. So we definitely got to like, we could do whichever one we were interested in. Also to add on, 
um, I would definitely recommend this to uh, people to try out because if they have a passion for animals like me, I think this would be very fascinating for them. And they would be, you know, very engaged. Uh, and just because it is called the Shed Aquarium and there's more aquatic animals than anything, we worked on a birdhouse. Uh, so for birds, like we can work on other things, work uh, other than like um, water, I mean, aquatic animals like birds, giraffes or something like land animals. So like it was um, very cool to find that out that we're just not working on uh, aquatic animals. So that was great to hear from the students about what other students should look forward to this year. Um, and so now I'd like to talk a little bit about what I'm looking forward to as a SHED st uh, learning staff member. Um, so I'm really looking forward to continuing to see students weave their creativity and with the science and conservation work that we do with them. So they did a phenomenal job of this last year and I'm excited to see even more of it this year. Um, the teachers that we work with love incorporating hands-on learning and creativity and art in the lessons and that excites me as well. You can see our, um, um, some example of student work on the right, the assignment was to create habitat for um, animals in the Chicago River. So they studied the wild mile, which is um, some habitat additions that SHED helps with um, creating in the Chicago River. And the students had an idea on the top of creating a fish breeding habitat um, for breeding and protection, kind of like a nursery, um, through some PVC piping and logs and buckets. Um, they also had an idea for an otter barge, which was really fun hearing the students describe it. It sounded just kind of like a huge otter water park and playground floating on the Chicago River. So I really enjoyed seeing that artwork and creativity um, shine throughout their work. And then I think Katie's going to share what, so Katie's been on the move today, so she's done a great job. And that's actually what a lot of our, our field trips are like, is um, showing students as much, as many parts of the aquarium as we can. So I'll let her catch her breath and tell us what she's excited for next year. I was like, she's talking so much about the otter barge. She must be giving me time. Um, <clears throat> yeah, for me, I'm, I really just, uh, love the opportunities we had to connect with students in person, which were very few last year. Um, but this year we've already connected about three times with students in person and it's just so much different and just getting to see them get excited about things, um, get to experience things and our opportunity to take them in the field to really connect them to the research they had learned about. Um, oh yeah, I should have taken more time, I guess. Uh, the research they had learned about uh, in the fall and just getting to see it, see what they were learning about um, was really powerful for me. And I'm excited to get to um, have those opportunities with them again this year. Katie? So another thing that we look forward to is supporting our teachers in whatever ways that we can. So here are the five teachers uh, in our Shed Academy Aquatic Science course who also participate in our professional learning community. Many of these teachers are also involved in the freshman field trip and the sophomore career experience. Um, so depending on what classes they teach, they sometimes are involved with many parts of Shed Academy. And there are also more teachers at these partner schools um, other than these five that have um, partnered with us to make sure the students have a great experience. But um, on the left, we've got Carlin Glennon from St. Lawrence High School. We have Karen Burkholder from St. Patrick High School. We have Dr. Brittany Coates from ITW David Spear Academy, Christopher Marks from St. Ignatius College Prep, and Ryan Walzer from CICS Northtown Academy. So um, there are a group of teachers that during our summer PLCs or professional learning community, um, we, um, of a during the professional learning community, we want to introduce the teachers to the course. We work on curriculum together. We try out new activities and some supplies that we purchase, things like digital microscopes and um, sieves and field equipment. Um, and we provide them with some professional learning by chatting with shed scientists and other professionals. Um, we chatted with one of our policy experts, which is really great um, uh, because we wanna dig into that a little bit bit more this year as well. 
So highlights from this past summer at our PLC include a discussion with Dr. Andy Cow on conch research. Um, we dissected a walleye with one of the teachers uh, who was new to joining us this year. And we spent some time exploring the Chicago River through Google Earth as a part of a new curriculum piece uh, for the course. So let's now hear from our Shedd Academy Aquatic Science course teachers um, who shared what they're excited about this year. They shared this in July with us. The best part of the Shed Academy as a whole is the multi-year work. We start with the freshmen and then move to sophomores with careers and with the juniors and seniors, they have the classroom opportunity and hopefully in the future internships. Um, I think this creates more touches with the students, so it's more opportunities for them to not only create relationships, um, but just more learning, more understanding, more opportunity to care, which I know is a big the shed mission as a whole. Um, I've learned a lot myself as a teacher this year, uh, information that I didn't know before that I can then pass on to my students. So it's a really amazing partnership. Um, the best part for my students, I think, is opening up opportunities for them. Um, you know, my students, most of them live in the city. They're not, um, they're not as involved maybe with nature and Lake Michigan and, and just having them see what's out there and having them learn about it has been very eye-opening for a lot of them, so they've enjoyed it. Um, My favorite lesson was um, one of the dissections we did with the help of the shed staff. We dissected these gigantic walleye last year, and I have two sections of students, or two, two classes um, with 28 students each. Um, so I had like 54 students, and we had a lot of fish in this giant cooler. And I told students, like, we're gonna dissect walleye, they're fish. I didn't know how big they were going to be. Turns out they were really big because they came from a farm uh, down the road. And so like the kids were like giddy with excitement when they came into the room because they kind of smelled a little bit fishy, uh, which is unusual. Um, and I was like, all right guys, here are the fish that we're going to dissect. And I pulled out this like two and a half foot walleye. I was like, here's your fish. And I was like, oh my goodness, it's crazy. Um, and it was just like perfect chaos for two hours. Everybody was really excited, but also really engaged in the lesson. And it's like a, a teaching highlight in my entire career. I we had the opportunity to go out into the field. We went out to Bodman Woods, and that was um, a really great experience. It was, I believe it was in May, yeah, it was in May. And that was truly the first time I've seen all the students interact together and actually laugh together. And they were, Know, teasing each other about a few things and looking in the water and splashing around and it was the first time I've seen them interact and, and so to see that towards the end of this year when it was a terribly rough year um, was really amazing and they have that memory and they talked about the last for the rest of the weeks of the school year which was great they kept talking about what they saw and learned and named some of the animals they found so we're going to do so many cool things. We're going to dissect things. We're going to go on field trips. We're going to talk about policy. We're going to talk about our community and the waters of Lake Michigan and Chicago River, as well as the marine life from around the world. Next year, I definitely look forward to being on site here at the Shedd Aquarium and in the natural areas of Chicago to be able to work with the Shed education staff, the, the Shed researchers again, and then of course my students, getting them out there and getting yet another touch and another opportunity to learn to care about the environment, whether it's just the aquatic world or of course the aquatic world as it attaches to everything else. So that was great to hear from the teachers. You might be a little confused. Were you in person? Were you virtual? Shed always connected virtually. And then the teachers had what such a challenging year as well because they were hybrid sometimes so teaching half the kids in front of them half the kids online um, sometimes they were um, completely virtual it was uh, a really um, an interesting year and so it was great that we got to support them so much because um, they really really appreciated it so i'll uh, continue and send it over to max um, to talk about the future Thank you so much, Michelle. It's it's amazing to think that a program and a partnership like Shed Academy can create laughter, right? And that that is one of these these like enduring lessons or memories from a school year. And I'm so happy that that you all and um, and our school partners were able to to make that happen last year. 
Well, looking uh, towards the future of Shed Academy, um, you know, currently we have six partner high schools in the program. And through these existing partnerships, we've learned that each school really prefers to participate at a different level that really best fits their students' needs and their school structures, which are, which are varying. Um, as we expand to additional schools, we're piloting Shed Academy Pathways. And this tiered approach builds relationships and provides educational experiences with high schools in targeted communities. And by providing uh, these and, and expanding these access points, our pathways approach allows us to better meet the needs of schools. We can see more students, more teachers, uh, as well as provide a more flexible structure. That doesn't require every school to, to commit to a four-year partnership, but participate in a way that really best suits their needs. We want to provide opportunities to engage students in that in-school kind of formal setting as well as outside of school in an informal uh, way with their peers, families, and mentors. I'll add as well, with the successes of this foundation and format of the high school Shed Academy style, um, we'll also begin applying Shed Academy model to elementary and middle schools to ensure an enduring impact in communities, in schools, and with students throughout their K-12 education. So from, from kindergarten all the way through high school. Finally, throughout this entire process, we're using a lens of racial equity to ensure that we're serving students who are least likely to have these type of experiences. We're currently in the process of creating an equity rubric to help us make uh, these decisions about school participation. With that, um, I want to thank you all for coming together to learn and experience Shed Academy from a student's point of view, um, going out in the gardens with us, um, going out and meeting, meeting Laguna, um, and traveling both virtually and um, in person, per se, um, in the field. Uh, we look forward to answering any questions you might have, either in the chat or in the Q&A. hearing from some uh, some comments in the chat at least that um, folks are really appreciating the hearing the student voice hearing the teacher voice um, and having those um, those testimonials right um, hearing from those participants and the almost 2,500 uh, students that we were able to impact in this last year Having some comments as well in the chat about what this investment means in our youth and in our Chicago youth, as well as the investment in kind of solving those two critical challenges that we talked about as well. Are there any questions at all during the Shed Talk about Shed Academy, about the experiences that we were able to provide in the four in-person or the four, I should say, in-school components of Shed Academy? Well, folks think about some questions. I know one thing that I'm really looking forward to is um, the depth to which our partnerships can grow. We started this partnership with ITW David Spear Academy as a pilot. And this was a way to learn about how Shed Academy as a model might grow. And um, we learned so much um, with that great partner and we were able to bring on, as I said now, uh, six full high schools and um, as, as I see both Katie and Michelle, um, as well as other staff in the learning programs department, um, develop relationships with the schools. Um, it's really um, impactful to see how far they can go, how much they can leverage the resources at SHED um, and the way in which SHED can open doors for students, for teachers, uh, as well as for administrators. With that, I am actually, I'm going to um, uh, introduce um, our last uh, guest here, and this uh, will be Dana Floberg, uh, and she is a member of the Shed Aquarium Auxiliary Board. Thanks for that introduction, Matt. Max, sorry. <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm an Aquarium Council member and a member of the Auxiliary Board and have been for a while, and I've also been involved with the Shed Aquarium. Academy um, program for the last few years. I just want to thank everyone that presented today, Max, Katie, Michelle, Melissa, Maddie, and their teams for such a fantastic presentation. 
even virtually, you can really feel the excitement and the love that everyone has for what they're doing. Um, we're building some incredible partnerships throughout the community. And it's just, <clears throat> excuse me, it's just a really cool program um, that you guys have come up with. And it's great to see how well it's working. Um, on behalf of SHED, I also want to give a special thank you to my fellow Aquarium Council and Oxford members for being here tonight. Your generosity really makes a truly astonishing array of work possible, and without it, this would not be um, possible. Um, so we're just so glad to have had a chance to spotlight SHED Academy and these partnerships um, through this monthly SHED Talk series. Um, we hope you'll continue to tune in and join us for more opportunities like this throughout the rest of the year. The next one, um, next Tuesday, September 28th, um, we hope you will join us for Immersion, SHED's new annual event, and it's featuring Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. If you, you can check out the link in the chat to learn more and also to purchase tickets. So, um, yeah, so it's great to see everyone, and we hope to see you all again soon. And thank you so much for your support for SHED and for being here tonight.